It's Nolan. What's going on, beautiful people? It's the kid, Jay Nolan, here. Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Industry, your number one source for music and entertainment commentary and breakdowns. Uh, we're going to get into quite a bit today, as y'all can see in the thumbnail here. We've got Beyonce, we've got the Neptunes, we got Offset, we got Lizzo. Yeah, it's kind of stacked today. We're not going to be here for a long time. It's going to be a good time, or <laughs> hopefully a good time. Because really, most of what we're talking about today is going to be the inner workings of the actual music and entertainment business. It's going to be a little bit more serious than what we're accustomed to because there's some real deep stuff going on right now. Uh, artists are going through it. The Neptunes, one of my favorite production duos, is going through some legal troubles amongst themselves right now. So, yeah, we're going to be getting into some real sh today. All right. Now. First thing we're going to get into is Beyonce, which is going to be light news. Um, Cowboy Carter is expected to make the Billboard 200. Um, and it's going to be a major week for Beyonce with the new album, Cowboy Carter. Right? Now, of course, when Beyonce drops, everybody got to tuck their plans in, tuck their whole summer in type deal. And, um, of course... She's dominating the charts. She's dominating everywhere. She's dominating in country. You name it, she's smacking them upside the head, right? Hits Daily Double has reported as of today that B's new LP is projected uh, to hit around 350,000 album equivalent units or, or somewhere north of that figure, giving it an easy number one on the Billboard 200 chart and making it a likely winner for all of 2024, meaning it probably will stay on the charts for quite some time, similar to how SZA has dominated for so long. Um, it's also on track to beat out B's previous album, Renaissance, by over 20,000 units, right? So this is about to outperform the previous, meaning that Act 2 is going even bigger. So <laughs> by the time Act 3 comes around, who knows what she might hit? She might hit 400,000. She might hit five. Might do, do gold in a week. I ain't going to put that type of pressure on it. But I'm just saying, as if she's going upward as she continues the campaign, I mean, this time around, it's a lot more succinct. With Renaissance, it was a little disjointed. We didn't, you know, we kind of knew something was coming, but didn't know exactly. A lot of people was like, "Where's the visuals?" The house music was a little bit off-putting for a lot of people. They weren't really ready to adapt to it. Over time, people got with it. You know what I'm saying? Over time, over the course of the year, folks found their favorites, found the songs that they didn't like as much. And by the time the tour came, the momentum was built. So now, following up a successful tour. Another album comes, smacks us in the head. So, again, she's building momentum. Okay? So, it's going crazy, man. Chart data points out that almost 150,000 of the first week total has come from activity on 16 carriages and Texas Hold'em. Cowboy Carter set a uh, first day streaming record upon its release. Spotify announced that day that it was their most streamed album in a single day of uh, all 2024, which is interesting because I believe Future and Metro Boomin the previous week had set that record as well. And Beyonce came and went, and went ahead and knocked them down too, who I'll be talking about in just a moment. Um, so yeah, that's where Beyonce is right now. She's, she's doing her thing and we're excited to see where things go from here. We, we had a whole album review session just a couple of days ago so if you're here for a more detailed perspective of the album you can always go back and watch that video um that will be the best place to get a well-rounded perspective of it we're not going to get into all of that right now or today so i advise you to do that after watching this okay now speaking of future and metro Boomin, right they've landed their biggest sales week you know, uh, before Beyonce came and smacked them, they were actually the biggest sales week of 2024, right? Because they came out a week ahead. So according to Billboard, the project debuted with 251,000 equivalent album units, which was, again, the highest week sales week of the year. And Future's second biggest sales week period in his career, right behind his collaborative album, What a Time to Be Alive, from 2015 with Drake. So uh 
a lot of future Drake talk, beef going on, and <laughs> to have your album come out and supersede the last project you did with your new competitor, that's interesting to me. Okay. We don't trust you. Also, Mark's Future's ninth number one album and Metro Boomin's fourth. Um, so yeah, man, they're killing it as well. Most of the sales of the album were powered through streaming with uh the LP 17 tracks clocking up in the upwards of 324 million streams. Um, of course, the big song off the project is like that, featuring Kendrick Lamar. That song is actually expected to land at number one on the on the uh, Billboard Hot 100 this week. So that's a huge accomplishment for all involved. Metro Boomin, Future, and Kendrick Lamar as the featured artists. We don't know if Kendrick or when Kendrick is going to drop another album. This is carrying him for a little minute. People are trying to see if J. Cole or Drake are going to respond to the jabs that, well, hey, this is more than jazz. He threw some haymakers. He threw some darts. He swung his goddamn sword. So people are still waiting to see if either one of them is going to clap back with anything. Of course, J. Cole has Dreamville Fest coming up this weekend. He was touring with Drake, but he's actually about to go on break and start going back into the studio to finish up his um, forthcoming album, The Fall Off. There might be some sort of EP or mixtape coming in between because there is another project called... Uh, He's a boy or it's a boy or something like that, that we don't know what the status of that is. He's been dropping these might delete later uh, video vlogs and snippets from from different songs. So he may be one of the first or the first to respond to Kendrick out of him and Drake. I don't think Drake is going to respond anytime soon. He's touring as J. Cole goes off of their joint tour. I think he's going to be moving about with Lil Wayne for a little bit. It seems like he's not in the studio. He's not doing the mobile recording thing in the in the hotels and the suites and the in the tour buses. So he's mostly talking on stage, talking about how nobody can compete with him and all this stuff, getting all his fans amped. But nobody cares about that. You know what I mean? Not not in the greater, not in the greater scheme of the culture. Y'all niggas always talk about you number one, who the hottest, this, that, and the third. Y'all want to dominate the game. Well, you have your only true competitor coming out and saying, fuck both y'all. So what y'all going to do about it? We ain't going to harp on that too long because we ain't even come here for all that. But just know I'm keeping a lookout my damn self. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, the actual song like that from Metro Boomin' Future and Kendrick Lamar, that song is already over 500,000 units sold so far. Okay. Just that particular track. Shit about to go gold on its own. And it's not a radio record, really. But the radio is kind of playing it. It's playing in the clubs. Like, Kendrick is a foul nigga. And I mean that in the best way possible. Like, to have people out here singing your shit in the club and you getting that two of the top niggas that, you, man. Motherfuckers been saying diabolical for the last couple weeks. That's diabolical. You feel me? In Drake-related news, he also put out another veiled response on stage. He says, I can never sell y'all out to sell my latest work. Um, and he says, never do you bad out the blue, but I'm down to make it worse. So it sounds like, it, it, hey, that shit rhyme. Most likely, he's going to go at Future. If this is a rhyme, he may have some shots at Kendrick. I need to know where that came from, because that shit rhyme. I can never sell y'all out to sell my latest work. Never do you bat out the blue, but I'm down to make it worse. I hope you didn't just do that for the caption, my nigga. Let that be from a real song. Put that shit out. Let the people know what it is. Moving right along. In a little bit more serious news, but still in keeping in light with the, the feuding that's going on in the game. We've got Pharrell Williams and Chad Hugo. As we know, they were partners for very many years as the Neptunes producing songwriting and running labels together. The whole nine childhood friends all the way back to maybe what was it middle school high school these niggas was fucking band camp band mates and the whole shit and unfortunately it looks a little rocky between them as of today okay so let's get into the story y'all 
Pharrell Williams and producer Chad Hugo, who together formed the prolific songwriting duo The Neptunes, are now battling each other in a legal dispute over the group's name. After Hugo accused Pharrell of fraudulently seeking sole control over their trademarks. Okay. The article states, before Pharrell was a solo star, the Neptunes produced a slew of radio hits in the early 2000s, including Nelly's Hot in Here, Snoop Dogg's Drop It Like It's Hot, Gwen Stefani's Holler Back Girl, Justin Timberlake's Rock Your Body, a whole bunch of other shit for Justin Timberlake. I believe they handled the bulk of the production work on that first solo album, along with Timberland. I think that was the same case for Gwen Stefani, too, at one point. But let's keep it going. As I stated, the legendary duo have been friends since childhood. Just in 2022, they were inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame together. However, in a legal action filed just last week at a federal tribunal, attorneys for Chad accused Pharrell and his company of attempting to unilaterally register trademarks for the Neptune's name, a move they say violates their longstanding agreement that saw the two of them splitting everything Equally, 50-50 down the middle, right? They always had to make decisions together, agreements together. But all of a sudden, Chad is saying, hey, bro, what the hell are you doing filing solo trademarks on our shit? Pharrell, what's going on, man? You one of my you one of my biggest influences, one of my big idols, man. Motherfuckers used to say I kind of favored you in high school and shit before I had facial hair and all that, man. Come on. And a quote. It says throughout their over 30 year history, Hugo and Williams agreed to and in fact have divided all assets. That's coming from Chad's attorney. Um, He says by ignoring and excluding Chad from any and all applications filed by the applicant for the mark, the Neptunes, the applicant, a.k.a. Pharrell, has committed fraud in securing the trademarks and has acted in bad faith. As of today, in a statement to Billboard, A rep from Pharrell's camp said there had been no ill intent behind the disputed trademark filing. They say Pharrell is surprised by this. We have reached out on multiple occasions to share in the ownership and administration of the trademark and will continue to make that offer. The goal here was to make sure a third party doesn't get a hold of the trademark and to guarantee Chad and Pharrell sharing ownership and administration. Hugo's attorney did not immediately return any request for comment. But at issue in the dispute are three separate applications to register the Neptunes as a trademark. One, covering the use of the name on streaming music. Another, for music videos and other content. And a third, covering live performances. Unfortunately, it does seem like all of these things would benefit Pharrell the most because Chad doesn't really come out the house. He does not perform on stage. He does not appear in music videos. Pharrell has been the front man of the Neptunes for quite some time. I wouldn't even say he was the front man back in 2020, excuse me, back in the early 2000s. It was just by default. They used to be together in a lot of the music videos. Pharrell had his own solo aspirations. He was kind of like the guy that was selling the songs in terms of like going in the studio, hyping up the artists, making them, you know, convincing them that this is the song that they needed to make. And he became the de facto leader. Of course, when they went on to do the NERD thing, he was the front facing person for that band as well. So we came to know Pharrell as the Neptunes based on just the simplicity of our thought process. Right. Because Chad didn't want to be in the limelight. Chad didn't want to be outside. He didn't care for that. His passion was music and being in the studio. So over time, it became like, okay, when you see the Neptunes, you really think of Pharrell. As time has gone by. It's gotten so bad that people have collaborated with the Neptunes, but Pharrell only gets the credit for it, right? So much so that even with later projects like Kendrick Lamar's Good Kid, Mad City, other stuff, they did some work on Beyonce's Renaissance, Act One. Both of their names were in the credits, but it seemed like Pharrell might have been the only one that was actually in the studio working with some of these artists. So it gets a little bit sticky and tricky. So I could see why Pharrell might have tried to, (laughs) you know, sidestep the situation because it's like, hey, if it's about um, being in music videos and other content, 
live performances and stuff like that, Pharrell is still out here performing, both solo and, you know, collaborating with other people. So it's just very interesting. I don't know what their intentions are. I don't know if there is ill intent. I can't say that it is. I just hope that they could patch it up. I hate to see these guys who I looked up to for so many years seem like they had very good solidarity. Like I said, they are childhood friends going way back. I hope they can figure it out. Now, these trademarks were filed in 2022 by PWIP Holdings, which is Pharrell's company, right? So I don't know. You got to reach out to your guy. Y'all ain't got your phone numbers no more. Y'all ain't got emails no more. Y'all ain't got the nigga address. Can't pull up on him. I don't know. It seems a little fishy, bro. And I fucks with you the long way. Pause. No diddy. Okay. So again, that's Pharrell's company that also owns such registrations as NERD, his Miami-based Good Time Hotel, and numerous other brand names connected to him, which I think is interesting for Pharrell to own NERD as well because I could have swore Chad was producing in those projects. In his legal filings last week, Chad's attorneys argued that Pharrell had knowingly and intentionally filed those applications without the required input from his partner, even though he was fully aware that either Chad or their partnership entity should have been listed as a co-owner. Nothing, either written or oral, provided Williams or his company with the unilateral meaning without having to consort with anyone else or consult um, the unilateral authority to register said trademarks. Chad's attorneys say that they've repeatedly contacted Pharrell's team about this problem and that his lawyers had admitted that Chad is equal co-owner of the trademarks and promised to include him, which is a claim that lines up with Pharrell's statement. However, they're not seeing any improvements, which is why they're now coming out with some sort of lawsuit. It's fucked up. Again, the case claims that sharing never actually happened partly because Pharrell's company has insisted on onerous business terms that would deprive Hugo of proper control and compensation. All right, this is where it get messy. So now they're saying Pharrell ain't trying to play fair. All this time that we've been doing everything 50-50, splitting everything equal shares down the middle, now you're took now you talking about some, uh, some onerous business terms, right? So that tells me, or at least signifies to me, that they could be trying to... Uh, Lowball Chad, like, hey, I'm the more valuable member here, so you should take less. It's fucked up. The petition did not specify what exactly those onerous terms included. Last week's filings targeted only with the three recent trademark applications, but Hugo's case could potentially expand beyond. That's because Pharrell's company also successfully registered the Neptune's name as a trademark for musical sound recordings and has another pending application to register the name for clothing and other merch. Pharrell, what the fuck going on, Brody? You talking about filing for streaming, music videos, performances, sound recordings, meaning you trying to put out new music as the Neptunes without your, without your bro. And you trying to put out some form of Neptunes merch. Come on, man. What's going on? I thought you had human nature with Adidas. Oh boy. I, I it, it pains me to have to do inside the industry and talk about these things because now I got to actually speak ill of people that I fucks with, looked up to, would love to work with. And we just keeping it a hundo on here, man. Damn. In his filing last week, Chad's lawyer said that the trademark registrations covering sound recordings and possibly others would be subject to a future legal action aimed at having them voided. So they, they, my boy coming for all that he's old, man. And I think that's rightfully so. That's fucked up. Don't be trying to, come on, dog. Ain't no Neptunes without the other one. I don't give a fuck how many times you showed up as yourself. If if it's all about Pharrell, if this the Pharrell show, go out and continue to do Pharrell shit. You got albums out under your own name. You got productions under your own name. Why the fuck is the Neptune so valuable to you when you know you built that with your guy? Don't cut him out the deal. Don't file it first and say we're going to fix you on the back end. No, have a conversation. Keep that shit trio, man. And again, me me having to say this does not distinct does does not uh extinguish any of my love for Pharrell. 
I just got to talk about it in the interest of fairness. That's your partner, man. Y'all came into the industry together. Y'all niggas was little kids, high school kids, learning how to produce at Teddy Riley Studio when y'all was in band. Keep it real with your guy. Or just go your separate way and do your own shit. It's very simple. All right? Pain me to have to talk about that, but we're going to move right along. In other music news, we've got Lizzo coming out saying that she's going to quit. We don't really know exactly the context of her quitting, if she's going to quit the music industry and entertainment as a whole. Uh, some of what she says could be alluding like she was a little bit on the brink of unaliving herself. I'm not saying that she should or that she's, you know, but I am saying the cryptic nature of her post made it seem as if she was ideating those sorts of thoughts. So let's just get into what she said. Lizzo goes online. I'm getting tired of putting up with being dragged by everyone in my life and on the Internet. All I want is to make music and make people happy and help the world be a little better than how I found it. But I'm starting to feel like the world doesn't want me in it. When people start saying stuff like that, like the world don't want me in it. I don't belong here, etc. That's when it's like, yo, somebody need to do a wellness check. I'm sorry. Somebody got to pop up on her. She continues, I'm constantly up against lies being told about me for clout and views, being the butt of the joke every single time because of how I look, my character being picked apart by people who don't know me and disrespecting my name. I didn't sign up for this shit. I quit. So that is the word from Lizzo. Now, what I do know is Lizzo for the past year and some change. She has been going through some legal battles, trying to fight with uh, alleged former dancers, some that were actually on the TV show where she was looking for, you know, people to join her her uh, her tour as backup dancers. Others that we don't know, and they all came out and said that you know she had some questionable tactics, questionable. Ways of dealing with the dancers. They allege that she forced them to partake in, uh, I guess, sexual activity in public places. She took them to Amsterdam and made them, you know, go to this weird strip club and was basically pushing their faces into people's ass and, and genital areas. That's what they claim. I don't know. They say she was extremely rude and mean. That she was actually fat shaming these other women based on their appearance, based on their workout habits and things of that nature. Which, if that's true, <laughs> it would kind of void all this shit she's talking. But, again, she's been fighting these allegations for some time. And the lawyer that's actually, you know, trying to go up against her or whatever... He hasn't been very sanctimonious with her either, calling her out every step of the way as much as he possibly can. As a matter of fact, um, the attorney, because he's representing multiple people that have issues with Lizzo. Uh, what is this guy's name? This damn attorney. Doo -doo -doo. Ron Zimbrano. Okay. He actually came out after her uh, performance at President Joe Biden's fundraiser in New York. And he said, it's shameful that Lizzo would be chosen to headline an event like this amid such egregious allegations. Without getting into the politics, I can't imagine why anyone would want Lizzo representing them in any way. Giving her reprehensible behavior is just a terrible look. Now, giving y'all a little bit more official background on this because i gave y'all my my uh you know synopsis paraphrased version but let's just get into it right a trio of backup dancers for the singer filed a sexual harassment lawsuit in august of 2023 against lizzo ariana davis noel rodriguez and crystal williams all alleged that the dancer and her production company created a hostile abusive work environment i've talked about this in the past but it was a while ago before a lot of y'all got here but let's continue they uh alleged that she made their working conditions intolerable they also alleged that lizzo pressured one of them to touch a new performer at a strip club in amsterdam Another allegation includes Lizzo subjecting the group to excruciating auditions following accusations that the trio had drank on the job. Okay. 
Lizzo's attorneys argue that the dancers were fired with due cause for poor conduct after showing up drunk to work. They say plaintiffs missed flights, arrived late, and hung over to rehearsals and drunk to performances, entered into consensual sexual relationships with male crew members on tour. God damn. Damn. Y'all are busting it open for other niggas on the... Ooh, wee. Damn. They exhibited a rapid decline in the quality of their dancing and professionalism and ultimately conspired to make and disseminate an on, uh, excuse me, disseminate an unauthorized recording of a creative meeting with Lizzo and the dance cast. So I don't know. It might be it might be unauthorized, but if that footage or recording is damning and putting her in a negative light showing that she was rude or out of order with her conduct, I would say it's permissible in court. I'm not going to get into all of the allegations, you know, not here to pile on to Lizzo at this time. I'm just addressing some of the things that she's been battling with. Of course, she's also battled with fat shaming of her own. People have been very critical of her appearance. I would say that she also, in the early days of her coming out, she kind of leaned into it herself when she went to that Lakers game with her ass out in the stands. You know, that was definitely indecent exposure in a very public place where children are known to be. Um, So that was just in the early days, right before the pandemic. Since then, she's done a lot of different things, basically teetering the line of I know I'm big. I'm body positive, but I'm going to do something outlandish to get y'all talking. And unfortunately, when the chatter started, she didn't like what she heard. So I wish her the best. I hate that she's going through this. But, you know, I've seen people go through this on a, on a much, 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 much smaller level, man. One of my best friends in high school, won't say his name, but he was very heavy, very big. And he always led with basically beating you to the punch. He would come out, if when you first met him, he would say something, hey, how you doing? And point out that he's fat or point out some type of joke pointing into a fat stereotype, how much he ate this morning or a different shit, you know what I mean? And after a while, it was kind of hard to take him serious because he had kind of pigeonholed himself into not only was being overweight or being big, his physical image, but it was also the image that he placed into your mind whenever you thought of him because he leaned into it so heavily, no pun intended. You know what I'm saying? So I think Lizzo is finally facing or finally dealing with some of the, uh, the adverse effects of that. I think she's been dealing with, dealing with it for a long time, to be honest, but the way she's processing it at this moment, she's feeling like she wants to leave the, the entire industry. I don't see why though. You know, she's got a new partnership with a swimwear company putting out some some uh, fucking swimsuits for the summer. There's a lot of people that are anticipating that. Um, it looks like she's slimmed down a bit. You know, looks like she's trying to be a somewhat a little bit more conservative with her appearance, you know, to where she doesn't have to strike everybody every time she comes on the scene. You know, I think there's a lot of people out there that actually find her attractive. Um, I know it's been hard for her to maintain healthy relationships and stuff like that, but I think that's for any star out there. I mean, even the most beautiful or most traditionally, I would say beautiful uh, people out there, it's hard to maintain a relationship because you don't know what people's in intentions are when they meet you. A lot of motherfuckers these days are very comfortable cheating. You know what I mean? A lot of motherfuckers don't want to commit. Niggas want to go into situationships or this or that or whatever it is. Fetishes, crazy shit. So I'm not trying to, uh, again, pile on to Lizzo, but I think, you know, just enjoy your life. I can only imagine the type of messages and, and things that you receive on your social media on a day to day basis because people are dickheads. People are mean. People are assholes. But, you know, the bigger you get, again, no pun intended, in this entertainment space, it kind of comes with the territory. Even the most well-liked or loved people get an onslaught of negativity about anything, whether it be the people you dated, whether the, it's the people you associate yourself with, say you're friendly or you're doing business with somebody who has their own set of, 
you know, harmful allegations on them that you may not know about or be privy to or know that person to do that sort of thing. You get judged by the people you associate yourself with. People try to tear you down for shit like that. If you dress a certain way, if you look a certain way, if you if you're accustomed to if people are accustomed to seeing you in a certain way and you go and divert and do a hard left turn that they don't necessarily like a la Doja Cat niggas is on your head about that. So I think everybody that's in a position of status in a position of being seen as an entertainer, celebrity, et cetera, it comes with hella scrutiny. It's not for everyone, but if you really love music and you really love what it is that you're doing, I say focus on the positive as much as possible and figure it out from there. Not everybody's going to be happy for you. Hopefully you have some sort of backbone or, or um, support system with your family. Lean into that. Um, I don't know what your personal faith is. If you have a, you know, a God that you pray to or any religion or anything like that, not to say that you have to, but if you do lean into that, you know, find guidance through that, find peace through that as well. So that's what we've got on Miss Lizzo. Okay. Um, another story I want to get into is offset. That's why we have his photo here. Um, he talks about some of the things that he learned in the business off of a bad $2 million deal. And he also goes into uh, how he thinks that TikTok should count toward your actual streams, which is something that other artists have voiced an opinion on as well. He went on Club Shay Shay with Shannon Sharp recently, and, and they talked about a number of things. He tried to tell uh, Shannon Sharp to stop wearing them tight-ass clothes the way he got made fun of at that motherfucking Total Wine. Shannon Sharp pushed back and said, hell no, I'm not going to change the way I dress. I don't give a fuck. That's how I want to be. Y'all niggas want to make fun of me? That's cool. I make too much money off y'all talking about me to change up who I am. Not mad at that. Let's get into the actual conversation about the industry, though. Since you entered, what have you learned most about the music industry? Because I always hear it's uh, cutthroat. They do you bad. They put you on these deals where they take it all the money or you get it advanced and blah, blah, blah. So what have Offset learned most about the business? Knowledge is key. And you can't blame. You can't blame the system because the system going to keep going. So what you got to do is, like I did, you got to adjust to the system, get to learning what, 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 ask questions. Like I'm asking questions. I don't want you to, before you a give me the money, I'm going to ask you what you, what I got to give you. Yeah. See, because at first, when I first came in the game, well, you got two million for me? Man, run it. Publish, you got five million? Run it. Not really reading the terms, not really understanding. And then your lawyer ain't going to tell you, your lawyer going to tell you what you got to do. But I feel like if you build with your lawyer, like I talk to my lawyer day to day. Well, and I'm asking questions and he know, like, I'm going to ask this question and I need you to break it down into a way that I can understand. So I understand what I'm signing up to because I've been a dumb artist before, just signing shit, just get because they get you with the money. You got to think you 20 years old. These folks like, look, you got a hot song. Let me give you uh, two million dollars. That's how it goes for a lot of people. Four, four, five years later, motherfuckers come out talking about they they. Uh, <laughs> They uh proverbial your booty hole hurting, you know what I mean? Because they done got stuck up and, and, and stabbed up through the industry. Motherfucker done ran through them and they ain't got nothing to show for it. But everybody else that they were associated with, everybody they did deals with, including the lawyers, made way with their cash. Not to mention some people get the little money, get that little $2 million, hire some random ass uh, financial advisor that they know nothing about. And that motherfucker run off on the plug with your money or put your money into terrible investments based on their own personal interests. All types of shit, man. I'm going to let Offset continue, though. Mm. But then I'm going to own you. And then you got five albums. But then soon the album come out, because most people don't know, when your album come out, you at an artist uh, level like me, man, your first month, they done made two, three million. Wow. But it ain't your cut, it ain't it ain't your money, and it's not counting to your recruitment. But on the, the what they own, that then recoup the two, three million, and they still got you in three million dollar debt. And quarterly counting it down, and they still gotta spend the money to get. So, but at, at, at the same time, they're making an investment. So you gotta understand the business terms and understand that business, these folks need to make the money. Right. So that and they they giving you a lot of money, but you also gotta learn, like, okay, cool. What are my deliverables for this money? What's the time limit on, on this on the deliverables? And then me, I love my label, cause I work my label. Capital Records, I work with them. I'm gonna go to the office. I'm gonna sit down and politic. 
If I got a complaint, I'm not going to try to be like an asshole about it. I'm going to try to get a way to to figure out the game. How can I politic better? How can I rub shoulders so this person can know? Because a lot of times we blame the label, but we ain't really gave them no type of information. Right. We just turn our album in, like, make this go. And you know, I like seeing this side of Offset talking, right? I think sometimes... We see him on stage, we see him dancing, we see him doing a Michael Jackson, we hear about him allegedly possibly cheating on Cardi B, all of this different type of stuff, and we kind of form an opinion on this guy based on a persona, based on what he allows us to see about him, which typically doesn't ever fall under the category of educated or intelligent. You know, even outside of his Southern dialect, which I can definitely understand and decipher. Some of y'all may not. Um, the dude, far as I know, was like a straight A student, was like a very educated kid coming up. I mean, we saw him in Whitney Houston videos. I mean, mama wasn't letting him do that shit if his grade wasn't right. You know what I mean? So um, I'm glad that we get to see a little bit more of his articulate side, a little bit more of like how he understands the business, his experience in the business, because he got took up through there, especially when he wanted to go off and do solo music and wanted to get QC out of his solo dealings. They they took a long little hiatus to figure that thing out. They finally got it worked out. But again, let's keep it moving. And it don't work like that. It's a whole process to everything. So did you learn, did you have to learn the hard way, yeah, these sure. lessons? Yes, had a lot of hard, hard way, mm. for sure, man. Like being trapped in deals, or be being signed signed into one deal. Like not owning, not own. I own my rights now, but like not owning your rights to your music, right? And all that is like you control. You so help help me out with this. Okay, there's ownership, there's masters, and there's publishing. Are are those? This got him four hundred thousand. All right, we're going to get through this little ad and whatnot because I'm playing this straight from the motherfucking YouTube. Y'all know how it goes sometime, man. Let me get back to it. Wait, you said there's ownership. ownership. Said, let me ask you a question. So is publishing and masters, is that the same thing? No. Or are they two different things? That's two different things. Okay, so you own the publishing. I own my masters. You don't? Uh-uh. I own a percentage of my masters, but right. I don't own 100 percent. Are you going to try to get them? Yeah, I'm trying to get them, but you got to just, you got to, like I just said, you got to finish your deliverables. Okay. So. I don't think Offset's ever going to get the full masters on Amigo shit anyway, because <laughs> you got to split the shit with your group mates, the label that put y'all on, whoever was the finders feed motherfucker middleman want to get part of that. So you always probably going to have fractional shares of that, which is to be expected in a group. Now, as a solo artist, yeah, I'm sure he'll get he could get that in a few years, you know, get his money up because they're going to charge him millions to get it. Um, but again, I'm going to let him roll. So say for instance, uh, uh, you get signed, they sign you $3 million, five albums, but your album term might say you can't drop an album for nine to 12 months. So if we do the math. That's some, some years. That's years, four years, four or five years, yeah, maybe even six sure. years, because the average artist ain't just finna drop no album exactly on the nine months. So right. we're still gonna- Well, it's more than five, six years. You see how these artists don't be getting out these goddamn deals. If they put you on five albums and say that you, and you can't put out an album, you know, but every nine to 12 months, niggas is not doing every nine to 12 months. You're gonna be in that motherfucking deal 10 to 12 years, right? 10 to 12 years. Because you got to have time to record. You got to have time to get all of the business, which is probably the longest process, getting all the business, paying, making sure everybody gets paid, which a lot of people still end up unpaid. Producers, engineers, writers, etc. Just getting them properly on paper. They still don't be getting paid right. That's an ongoing issue. Um, making sure your team is included in all of the personnel and making sure they're getting paid getting visuals done, if you're going on tour, all of these different things will contribute to how much time it's going to take for you to get to that next album. You could offer one album, you may be out living for two years. Then you got to go through lived experiences and things in your own life before you actually feel comfortable going back in the studio with something to talk about, unless you're just going to just start wishfully thinking all over the album, coming up with b bullshit. You know what I mean? So yeah, more like, 10 to 12 years rather than five to six. Be a stretch. You're creating, and then while that time, while it's going on, they still got to spend the money into you. So it's doubling down. So it's like 
Most artists, you don't see no chick from the label, but the one that you sign. That's it? That's it. Now, publishing gonna go, the publishing, that's where publishing come in. They gonna go see where all your music been licensed, get all the licenses, you can recoup through streams and all that, but it be pennies to a dollar. So it might, so instead, like for me, my publishing, I have an admin deal where we are in uh, agreement that you will go get my stuff, I'll give you a piece of it, but I'm not gonna put for people that don't know about publishing ad, man, I'm just going to give it a little bit of extra uh, context. So there's companies out there that will go and, and every artist, you know, you have an opportunity to own your publishing. Sometimes your label will take it from you. Other times you'll get, you know, just sign a traditional record deal. You'll own your publishing coming into the game. After you sell X amount of records, you'll get approached by a publisher. You could get approached by Universal Music, Sony Publishing, Warner Chapel, these are all um, huge major players, BMG, et cetera. And they'll offer you a bag, right? They may offer you $3 million, right? If you're a smaller artist, they may offer you $50,000, $150,000 to say, hey, we'll run your publishing for you, you know what I'm saying? Or we'll buy your publishing or whatever the case may be, right? They offer you an opportunity to get a pub or co-pub deal. In other instances, what he's talking about is an admin deal, which basically means that they become responsible for orchestrating what happens with your publishing, but they don't own it. They go out and collect on your behalf to make sure that all of the streams of income that are supposed to be coming in on behalf of your written music is coming in as is due. And they may take a 5% cut, 10% cut perhaps even a 20% cut depending on the deal and who you're working with and how, you know, aggressive they are with getting your royalties. They may take a higher cut off of your publishing, but they do not own it. Their name does not go on your paperwork. They are just facilitating it because you're out doing what you're supposed to do. You don't have the necessary partnerships and organization relationships and all of those things to just go track all this stuff down. Your money is coming from, you know, a thousand different places, literally a thousand different places. So one man is not going to go out and do that themselves. So what he's talking about is a smart move. But a lot of people end up selling their publishing early on because they are starving because they only did get that first advance from the label. They're trying to figure out how to get more money. Right. They might do like what people have alleged that Nicki Minaj did in terms of um, getting a getting a um, an advance on your tour. Right. Now they're trying to say that her current tour is put up as collateral against the previous tour and they also leveraged her music rights to make sure that if the tour doesn't recoup that's the money that they'll be getting is off of her music rights again this is alleged i don't know how real that is i'm not here to disparage Nicki minaj i'm only using that because it's the most recent and the biggest story that had anything to do with this this sort of conversation but i want y'all to really i ain't gonna do that Y'all know, if you don't know, you don't know. You know what I mean? I've got nothing against this woman other than I disagree with some of her antics. Anyway, in a situation like what Offset is talking about, they go out and collect on your behalf. I just want to explain it a little further because he's going to start talking. He's going to talk fast. And I want y'all to walk away understanding how this stuff works. That's why we do Inside the Industry. Put it all in your hand and you can go grab everything and then I get the crumbs because then I'm gonna be left in the deal forever. So the purpose of that is to recoup and, re and renew every time. Every two, th every two, three years, you're renewing mm -hmm. without having to drop a project because you right. know, with catalog, I got a long catalog with right. Migos and my solo stuff. It, it recoups. Like I'm finna go re up now. Right. I'm finna re up soon after this album. <laughs> <laughs> so the streaming, I, cause I've heard some people say streaming ain't no money. Then, um, I did talk to 21 Savage. Savage says, yeah, hey, they cut me a check every month, so there gotta be some money in it. Where, what's your take on, what's your take on, on, on streaming? I get cut a check too. Streaming is, 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 is not for everybody. Like, I ain't gonna lie, Savage got it. He, 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 he did it right. Like, you get hot first, you get a risk, you go, he went platinum before he was signing anything. So he got his masters, everything, but that don't be for, that's like, he like a 10%. He like a 10 percenter with his situation. Okay. But I'm saying for most artists, streaming ain't nothing but like a, 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 a to me, I'm gonna say it's a hype thing. Cause you get you get sound stage money, but the like you might All right. 
just so we can, I know I got to get a context. You throwing names out there. So sound exchange, I've got videos explaining sound exchange. I used to do more music education type content, but of course the entertainment, the, the gossip sector, the beef, the trending news stuff, it just does better. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to take what I have in my knowledge and apply it to what goes on in the everyday news cycle of what's going on in the world. So Sound Exchange is a company that collects royalties for artists based on uh, digital performance royalties on radio or or um, internet radio to be more specific. So if your music is getting played on Pandora, if your music is being played on Sirius XM radio, if your music is getting played on, you know, let's say a blog talk radio type place, or even if your music is getting played on AMP before they went out of business or uh, what's that other joint? The other company everybody's on. Damn. Station Head even. You know, um, you're going to get money off of the streaming on Station Head because they go directly between, you know, whatever platform you want to use, whether it be Apple Music, Spotify, etc. But then they also have to pay licensing money on that as a uh, internet radio platform so they pay that out to sound exchange as well for the licensing on that and they collect that and you get paid off of it that's what sound exchange does that's why he's mentioning it but that's also why he says these companies can be returning pennies on the dollar because those streams are only worth so much money in real time it takes a lot of those plays in order to accumulate money but for artists of his stature or any of these other artists that are like really major that get a lot of support you know, it could end up being substantial checks over time, especially over the course of because they only pay you out a few times a year. So you could get a decent check off of that um, during the uh, SWV escape show. Remember, that came up in the conversation as well for um, one of the I think it was escape members and they were beefing because somebody's sound exchange check got intercepted by the sister or something like that. And. Tiny's mom kind of intervened and was like, you know, you should, be, you should be making all this money off of your sound exchange and you're not getting your checks. That sound familiar to any of y'all? Yeah, I talked about that. I can't think of everybody's name off the top of my head right now, but I definitely discussed how major those checks could be. That could be hundreds of thousands of dollars for artists that, especially when you're getting into back collections, because they've been out since the 90s and all of these new different partnerships came into play and these internet radio stations came into play, stuff that predated even the invention of Sound Exchange. So they had to get all of their, uh, you know, back catalog of royalties, which was a substantial amount of money, and the shit was getting intercepted and stolen. So again, it could be good checks, but it takes time. Might have all these billions of streams that ain't finna register to your to the to the, that you ain't finna be getting no check like that all the time because it's that check is going to the label for signing you. Right. So if you let's just say they own the rights, they own the masters, they own the publishing. So oh, so in order for you to get that the billion stream for it to hit your pocket, you need to own the publisher, the catalog, and all that other stuff. Yeah, but it see, it's two, it's it's, it's two things with that. See, I don't want to talk too political. All right, for, for see why I'm see why I'm breaking it down. He said he don't want to talk too political. This is like. Some folks that just be hard headed. You got to give them. You got to get with them folks a little bit. Because they're still a machine. Like the label is still a machine. For sure. I, I never tell nobody to be just straight independent. Even though people say it all the time, but it's like you gotta have you already gotta, you already gotta have some money put to the side before you just say, I'm gonna be an independent artist straightforward. I'd rather be with a machine. Cause it's a partnership and I sell music and my music sells. Right. Cause they're gonna push it, they're gonna help push it out there. And yeah. you because basically you you're spending their money making money. Yeah. But you have to, but you have to position yourself right though, Offset. Because you gotta have you, leverage too, like yeah. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta not take the money up front. Like if I'm tell, talking to a new artist, I'm gonna tell them like, hey, listen, build your buzz up to the highest peak that they can get you, and if you can't get past that peak, then you get with them folks, because then you got marketing and branding, which right. we don't be knowing a lot about. You know what I mean? But be smart. But like, if like I said with Savage, he leveraged himself great, cause. He put, he got high, he went platinum. He had already sold a million copies before a label, he signed to a label. So now that's leverage. Like I just said, you get leverage. Now you can walk in there and tell you what you want. Hey, look, man, I want my masters. I want this, this, this. And even if you get it, masters, I'm only giving you 10%.
and then you in a great position. But most artists ain't like that. So what I recommend to most artists is like in steals right now is figure out your deliverables, your albums, pay attention to them time spans of you dropping them albums. Try to, if you get, if you get, so say you drop an album and it was your first Buzz album, that second album do better numbers than that Buzz album, then start to try to renegotiate because right. everything is for negotiation, especially if you making the money. For now, sure. if you, now if you grabbing all the money yourself, doing your shows and doing all that and you ain't really blowing up as a brand, they probably ain't gonna rock with you. It just need to make sense. You need to make sure you building your stuff up so you can come with them with the leverage. Like, hey, this album, I sold 50,000. My second one, I sold 100,000. So can I change this term from 12 months to maybe six months? Cause, cause now you need to be able to drop music rapidly anyways. Right. That wait in a year, two years, somebody yeah. else be done came through two, three folks, then be done came through, kick the door in and got hot. And people forget about you nowadays. Quick. Mm -hmm. You gotta stay consistent. Has streaming help or hurt hip hop? It's a great question from Shannon Sharp. Has it helped or hurt hip hop? I mean, it brought a lot of people to be stars that we would have never discovered. I mean, even the same thing with social media, with TikTok, etc. I think so. So let's see what Offset got to say. The fucking ad popped up. Got down. It helped. I see a lot of people say it hurt, but they not. I see a lot of older artists say that, mm -hmm. but y'all not seeing the money we send. It back in okay, for instance, back in the day, you be you, you could be selling albums, but not on the top A list or status, and you ain't finna have no money like that. It's folks that ain't never been on the billboards with M's mm -hmm. because it's, people are streaming. People are streaming. Stream don't always resonate because it's, it's it's artists that stream big and don't never they don't need they don't go to radio they don't need the radio they stream big they just stream 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 and then that sh somebody who's doing that right now is Joiner Lucas check out his new album not right now I'm busy completely independent he's got millions of streams on the album got. Big features on an album, Jelly Roll, all types of people. Some people say Joyner is corny. I, I'm not one of those people. But study what he got going on because he is killing it independently. And he's always working with major artists. This dude got songs with Lil Baby, J. Cole. Um, who else did he work with? Future. He got a song with Jelly Roll, as I stated. He got a song with Will Mother F. and Smith. In the music video, these niggas is friends now. He in a movie with Mark Wahlberg because they became friends. Like indie artists doing all of these types of shit, and niggas act like it's not happening because he not. You know what I mean? I don't know why, because he's not uh, perpetuating a street image. I guess shit crazy. When you having high numbers and streams, that create festivals and different shows and fan bases is into that now. The kids are into who got, dang, this song got a lot of streams. This, this person got a lot of monthly listeners. People look at that now. Back then, people weren't really on it unless you did some amazing, oh, he did first week million sales. And if you right. look at hip hop back then, it was probably like five, six artists, like 50, uh, M. M. It was like Wayne. It was only a few of them hove. It was only a few of them doing it, and it was a lot of rappers, and they you would see the difference in the money. With us streaming, even though you might not see a streaming check. I ain't gonna lie, he's making really good points. Cause just imagine some of the artists that we really liked back in the days, they might have got decent deals up front, but how much money were they really making off of those sales? You know what I'm saying? Especially if their sales wasn't measuring up to where we thought they should be. That's why we see certain people out here, a la Keith Murray, down bad in 2024. He was one of those artists that had name recognition, had a few hits, had big music videos, etc. But that old school success has not translated into present day success. He hasn't transformed or converted into being a high streaming artist, still trying to live off that old money. Shit, look a little, a little different. Look a little funny in the light. So he's making excellent points. Even though I'm not a huge advocate for streaming, I got to understand his perspective on the situation, and he's not wrong. Man, if you're a streaming artist, man, they give you a lot of opportunities. They give you a lot of people, people, because people are into that now. People dive into that. The kids is into that. Streaming artists, people, it's crazy now. I feel like now that people are more into trends, like what's trending, 
Know what I mean? Like, so yep. if you if all of a sudden all the blogs post like, oh, this song got five million streams, a couple of days later, it might have seven million streams just from that, just from people seeing it, because people go, people be getting on stuff late. What's your take on TikTok? Because TikTok is threatened to remove some of it from their platform because people are using uh the music. What's your take on TikTok? I feel like I, 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 TikTok, cool. My kids love TikTok. What I just, as an artist who, who makes great music, you know what I mean? I feel like it should be also, TikTok need to be counted as a stream too. Right. You know what I mean? Cause, and it's, but I'm gonna keep it real too. TikTok is taking a listener away because they going to, instead of like, listen to a beautiful art of song, they going to the part that might, it might be 10 seconds, 15, 20 seconds. And people, and when people is doing it so much, it make people feel like they gotta dis get discovered from TikTok. Like new artists, you don't gotta do that, bro. Good music gonna be good music regardless. Mm -hmm. But I be hearing a lot of TikTok music now. <clears throat> I ain't hating on it. I salute it. I salute it because I don't want to seem like I'm hating on the young generation. Right. I just feel like it do kind of close the door on the artist, right? Like on the artist side. And this is why uh, TikTok and Universal are embroiled in a battle. And Universal took the music off of TikTok because Universal wanted more money. It was time to renegotiate their deal for their catalog, for their artists. And they were like, yo, y'all need to give us more money. We're not coming back in for the same, you know, amount that we accepted in the last deal. TikTok, on their side, they feel as though they shouldn't be looked at as a streaming company, which is why Universal wants more money, because it's like y'all are pulling a lot of people's attention from going and streaming our records, right? Or from spending more time listening to full records. People are consuming our music in like, like Offset said, 10, 15, 20 second increments. But that's what people are spending so much time doing. Yet we're not getting paid off of those plays. Now, if you really love the song, you'll go to the streaming platform or you'll go on iTunes and buy it. But that percentage of people that's going and making those conversions are far less than those that are just seeing the 10 to 15, 20 second clip, liking it, and then going on to something else, right? So what TikTok says is, well, we're only putting your music out in 30 second increments at most 60 seconds. So people are not on here to listen to your music. They're using your music as ancillary, you know, background noise for whatever it is that they're saying. That's what TikTok is basically trying to tell people, okay? And my next subject after we get through this offset thing is going to be talking about how Sony Music might actually be the next company to pull their catalog from TikTok. They already have an active license where the music is available, but they're actually looking into pulling some of their shit from there because of this conversation. But it can blow up. It can make your catalog blow up. Like, for instance, you might have a song you dropped four years ago and it go viral tomorrow and it rechart. That's the good. That's why I say it's the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. So um, when when you said um, artists going viral, do you believe that's that's sustainable? Like you have a song and all of a sudden it just goes viral. Can that artist artist have sustainability? For sure. Let me tell you why. Because every person that went viral, every every generation, y'all just, older generation just ain't called it viral. Right. When somebody had a hot song that you never known, and then the song becomes hot, and they're a new artist, that's viral. Okay. So, viral is viral. It, it, it depends on the art. The artist, it's just if it's a great artist or not. So now, sometimes people go viral, and they don't be able to do nothing after that. They might not be the best artist, but I feel like everything has always been viral in the music. Period. Just like Michael Jackson when he first dropped, when he when he first dropped off the wall. Off the wall. And then when he dropped bad, it's viral. It's everywhere. Viral don't mean nothing but everybody see it and everybody turning into it and and channeling in on this one thing. Oh. All right. So we're gonna get off the offset thing and we're actually gonna talk about a viral artist who's going through some turmoil right now. Okay. Off of TikTok. So there's an artist out there by the name of Trey Fuego. OK, he's a popular rapper on TikTok and he's being forced to pay Sony Music, as I mentioned, over eight hundred thousand dollars in damages for using a copyrighted sample without permission. OK. And the reason why they went so heavy handed on this particular fine, they're saying, is because they want this to teach him a six figure lesson 
about carefully selecting the materials included in his rap. So they took ex, ex, extra, extra like, uh, basically extra, it was heavy handed. You know what I mean? Like they wanted to make sure that he got the message. So again, Sony sued Trey Fuego, real name Dontrell uh, Davon Clark Rainbow in 2021. So this is a record that is a couple years old, um, accusing him of using a blatant sample from a 1986 Japanese instrumental song in his song called 90MH, a track that Sony claimed had been featured on over 155,000 TikTok videos, and it was streamed over 100 million times on Spotify. Jesus. So he was going super viral. Like, this <laughs> this ain't your average viral. This nigga, I never heard of this Trey Fuego nigga, but damn, that's major. After struggling to locate him, a federal judge ruled last year that the 20-year-old rapper had, in fact, infringed upon Sony's copyright. And in a follow-up ruling just from Wednesday of last week, the same judge ordered him to hand over a whopping $802,997, okay, which covers roughly the $700,000 he earned in profits from Spotify and other platforms and approximately an additional $100,000 he would pay Sony in license fees. Now, he can't. Damn, boy, you made 700 k off streaming? Shit. You did some numbers, my nigga. Damn. In a quote, it says, the court hopes this case will serve as a $802,000 lesson for the defendant in carefully selecting the materials used in his raps. That is what the judge said. The judge also ordered Trey Fuego to pay ongoing royalties, including a 50% of all publishing revenue and a 20% cut of recording revenue. And he's going to have to pay over $2,000 in legal costs that incurred that were incurred by Sony. So whatever legal costs that it took for them to actually get him in court, he got to pay that. He got to pay over 800,000 back to the label and for any ongoing streams that he gets, he has to pay 50% of his publishing and 20% of his Spotify, Apple Music streaming revenue as well. You damn near need to sign with these niggas at this point, boy. Because uh, they getting all this money up at you. You might want to sign with them, do a deal. Because sheesh. They say Sony pursued a reasonable non-frivolous claim to vindicate infringement of his copyrighted work. Some may query the wisdom of pursuing a claim against a relatively small fish like Trey Fuego, but the fact does not render Sony's motivation improper or their lawsuit unreasonable. What they're basically saying is the judge was was um, saying, why go after this artist who isn't mainstream? He's not signed to anybody. He's not doing anything major. That might be the only song that he had. Probably not, because once you get a song that's streaming that well, people are going to go listen to your other records. But He's not a household name or nothing like that. So it's like, why go after this smaller artist? He says, hey, whatever their motivation is for that, it's not unreasonable. Right. Sony has been chasing Trey Fuego in some form since January of 2021. So this has been a four year, excuse me, a three year process. When the company notified him that they believed 90 MH was built on an illegal sample of a song called Reflections by Japanese composer Toshifumi Hinata. This song was released in 1986. After filing takedown requests in August of 2022 to get the song pulled, Sony finally launched a lawsuit that December. So they gave him over a year that they were trying to reach out to him and just get the song taken down, sent him um, cease and desist, DMCA takedown letters. He ignored all that shit. He said, fuck y'all. In the end, who did the sticking? In his complaint, the label pointed out that Hinata's song had seen a recent surge of popularity after appearance in Netflix's 2020 film Tiger Tail and placement on a popular ambient music playlist on Spotify. So basically what they're saying, well, let me just go ahead and read their fucking quote. Uh, Trey Fuego brazenly sought to ride the coattails of Hinata's creativity and popularity without regard to the U.S. copyright laws or the rights of the plaintiff. So basically what they're saying is after this song became popular on a Netflix film in 2020 called Tiger Tail, 
which he probably heard that song on there and was like, oh, that's fire. His motivation probably was to just go make something. He probably, uh, there's no way he could have anticipated it was going to go this big. He was a nobody. But they're using that and saying, no, you rode the coattails of this song because it was on Netflix. So you, so you knew people were going to go look for that song. And in return, they found your version of the song. That's what Sony's basically saying. Um, they furthermore, they state he used and copied the plaintiff's work without so much as asking or paying a cent to the plaintiffs because sample clearance does cost money. Um, and he continued to exploit that music despite the plaintiff's demand that he stop. Sony's lawsuit took a bizarre detour last year when the judge uh, ruled that the label could forego traditional methods of contacting Trey Fuego and instead simply send him a DM on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok or SoundCloud. In doing so, the judge ruled that Sony had made extensive efforts and had gone to great lengths to find Trego, Trey Fuego in real life, including seven separate attempts to serve him and hiring a private investigator. Let's, let's just keep this shit going, man. This nigga was really on the run from these boys, man. In one particularly notable effort, Sony's representatives apparently went to his mother's house on Mother's Day in hopes that he would be there to celebrate. Again, they were trying to serve him his issue, his his lawsuit. Unfortunately, they still came up empty and on that attempt. They say, sadly, he was not there and his own mother claimed she did not know who he was because she probably like, who the fuck is Trey Fuego? With those procedural issues settled. Judge Pittman ruled on the case in October, excuse me, in November and sided decisively with Sony. Though the judge noted that this case pitted one of the largest international entertainment conglomerates on the planet against a 20 year old kid. He ruled that this David and Goliath posture would not protect him from his due liability. They even quoted his song in the ruling to make it even worse. They say to quote 90 MH, this case involves a young man who was quote unquote too focused on getting dough to understand the broader implications of purchasing a creative work without proof of originality or license to use. Again, to quote 90 MH, Trey Fuego likely imagined that Sony wouldn't quote unquote really want smoke enough to prosecute this claim, but they did. At this moment, neither Trey Fuego or any spokesman from, or oh, excuse me, nor spokeswoman, I guess they reached out to uh, a female on the team from Sony Music has responded to any request for comment. So, hey, they said we're going to teach your ass an $800,000 lesson for fucking with our music, brother. And, hey, I, I, although they were heavy handed, they did give him up two and a half years to figure his shit out. Whether he was going to take the song down, whether he was going to um, respond to their emails, respond to their DMs on all these different social media platforms. He ignored them. He said, take your uh, cease and desist and shove it up your ass. This is why niggas don't be succeeding in life, man. If, if I would have caught a hit like this off of TikTok and motherfuckers started reaching out, I'd have took that bitch down immediately and put out a whole nother song the next week and told niggas my story. The stories go just as viral as the music these days. You played your hand the wrong way, my nigga. You might want to come out and tell your story today so you can try to get your shit back popping. Don't let the... <laughs> your name is Trey Fuego. Don't let the fire burn out, brother. Now, in my last story here, again, I told y'all Sony Music is not ruling out TikTok removal. So, let's get into it. Okay? Um... Warner CEO Robert Kinkle has stated their company is happy with their TikTok deal. But again, Sony says they could uh, try to pull their music because of the astonishingly small payouts that they receive from TikTok. Of course, that is if TikTok is not completely banned in the U.S. That will make two of the biggest companies in music taking down all of those artists, which a lot of those artists depend on TikTok to get their music out. That would be a huge blow to the industry on a negative, on a negative side, you know, especially because Instagram doesn't have nearly the virality that TikTok does. Instagram plays on our head tops all the time. I was just getting a lot of good traction a few 
weeks ago, about a month ago on Instagram. I put some shit up a couple weeks ago <laughs> last week. My shit's all of a sudden not reaching. You know, my stories ain't reaching nobody. My reels ain't hitting nobody. I said, man, fuck it. We gonna just do inside the industry over here on YouTube. Nigga, fuck all the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Because I ain't got time. I ain't got time for y'all to be figuring out your algorithm and changing the algorithm every six weeks and shit like that. So if these niggas pull their shit from TikTok, it's going to be, it's not going to be a hit on TikTok, to be honest. It's going to be a hit on the artists that are signed or on um, Sony Music subsidiary companies, right? The CEO, Rob Stringer, says he won't rule it out. And he was behind the decision to remove Sony from another app called Resso, which is a music streaming service owned by ByteDance, who also owns TikTok. That removal also came as Sony Music and Resso failed to reach a new licensing agreement for the music. This is enough. This is exactly the issue that Universal went through. So just keep an eye out. And of course, what these huge corporations and conglomerates do is probably not of your concern. But if the music from your favorite artist starts coming down, which means that the videos you may enjoy watching with the sounds in it, those videos start getting muted. There's less good options for music to put on your own content and shit like that. That's what's going to make y'all pay attention. But just remember inside the industry, Jay Nolan already told you why. All right. That's my show for this evening. If y'all wonder why I keep doing these longer shows and covering a variety of topics is because this is a conglomeration, excuse me, a conglomerate or an amalgamation. I said conglomeration. I got to put that. That might be an album title or some shit um, of smaller topics that I don't wish to do individual videos about because I might only talk about them for five, six minutes and it's really not worth spending time doing. So take this bit, take this bit, take this bit, take that bit, put it all together into a variety show. And right now it's kind of slow period in, in the music and entertainment field. A lot of people are going through kind of planning periods to get their summer shit together, get their fall shit together. You know what I'm saying? It's the top of the month. Things should start getting interesting as we get into the second week. So right now it's a lot of smaller things going on. And I'm like, man, let's just talk about it all in one WAP and make my life a little bit easier. Hopefully y'all enjoyed the show. Hopefully y'all rocked with me for the entirety. You know what I'm saying? Much love and respect to all my insiders who have helped us build, who have been keeping us going, keeping me motivated to keep creating content. Those of y'all that continue to show up in the chat, show up in the live chat, show up in the comments. Again, even though some of us may disagree about different fundamental things, maybe we're fans of different people. Some of y'all are part of hives of certain artists that I may not always speak that highly of. I appreciate y'all and I appreciate the respectful debates. All right. So much love and respect to all of y'all. I will see you shortly, probably tomorrow. All right. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Run this back if you got to share it with a friend. If you're just now seeing me on YouTube for the first time, go ahead and subscribe, become an insider and I'll see y'all on the next one. All right. Much love and respect. I'll catch y'all later. Peace. King of my city in Kodasak uh, Coming, I swing like Soldier Rat yeah. Leading my people like quarterback Boy, I study this shit, I'm an almanac yeah. Had to get up and grind Knowledge is booming, I'm here to apply Came with the chip and the dip It just single the mind We finna do more to survive I need my shit yeah. Spinning the block for the Gouda We hitting the jewel to flood out the net yeah. We don't do beef on computers I'm straight out the sewer We come when you rest yeah. Niggas be looking perplexed So keeping my foot on their neck uh -huh. No map, I trust my gut for the quest With drama, I'm fully oppressed yeah. I was ready for years and they died of me uh -huh. All of a sudden, they tell me they proud of me I've been dropping these haters like calories uh -huh. Cross them out, I came back with some battery Stand for my honor, but you run no gunner Packing a stick with a drummer Wanna catch my bad one fumble I done came too far to be humble